I'd like to say, George, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. I think we all learned from it. And uh, congratulations to you and everyone else who worked on the Nisqually plan. And, uh, we're keeping our reputation for being ahead of the curve here, so thank you. Okay. Well, that's, that's right. <laughs> Get ahead. That's right. <laughs> So uh, it's my next, my pleasure now to introduce Mark Daly, uh, director of the Thurston Regional Planning Council. He'll talk about uh, the county sustainability plan and looking off into the future. Thank you. So I'm going to have to find some more light to turn off so that people can see this a little bit better. So bear with me. That's good. That's that work? Good. All right. So we've talked a lot tonight about what's going on over kind of the next 20 years. But for folks that haven't heard of Thurston Regional Planning Council, we're a 22 member organization comprised of the county, all the cities and towns, and the Squally tribes member, school districts, uh, economic <coughs> development council. So really all the leadership entities in our county are members of Thurston Regional Planning Council. And it's our job to look <coughs> even further out. And so when we're talking about something as essential as water, yes, it's good to look out 20 years, but 20 years isn't really all that long. And we need to be looking out further to, find, to make sure that we have water well into the future. Ooh, well, no pun intended. Um, so stepping back a little bit, looking at our population, we are, grow we are a very fast growing area. In 2018, we were just under 282,000 people. And the uh, projections that we do at uh, Thurston Regional Planning Council, we're projecting that by 2040, we'll have just under 394,000 people, about a 40% increase. It's not quite exponential, but that's a pretty steep growth curve. <laughs> and, it matters where those people go. I'll talk a little bit more about Sustainable Thurston in a moment, but we have a goal in, in that plan that 5% or less of new growth by 2035 occurs outside of cities and outside of the urban growth areas. And urban growth areas are those areas around cities where we are planning for urban uh, intensive sort of uh, development. And right now we're at about 11%. And the, the trend's going the right way. But there are some things that suggest that we're kind of leveling off on that going the right way. For example, in 2017, the building permits across the county, 29% of the residential building permits were in that rural area. If we're gonna hit that, that goal, we need that to be around that 5% level. So we're, we've still got work to do. <laughs> but don't worry, the sky's not falling. Um, so where's that growth coming from? It is not from uh, us proliferating humans. Um, our, our, the natural growth rate is pretty steady. Even though people are living longer, our families are getting smaller, and so that's what this curve here is. It's pretty steady. And so where our growth is coming from is people tend to stay here, and a lot of people are moving here. And we are seeing it's got lots of peaks and valleys, but overall, we are gaining more population every single year, and that's where that growth is coming from. And our projection is just looking at current trends. There are things that are going to potentially disrupt those current trends. This map is a map of water risk by 2050. And the dark areas, uh, not surprisingly, those are the areas that by 2050, it's predicted that they may not have enough water to sustain their current population. And so we're going to have folks moving from California, Nevada, Arizona, and they're going to be moving north areas where water is relatively more plentiful and they're already kind of using the term water refugees and we're going to start seeing that and that has the potential of increasing that growth rate 
even higher. So why is water becoming more scarce? And I'm sorry to step back clear to the Earth, but this is, this is kind of an important one. So that's the Earth, that's the moon. This sphere here is all the water uh, on the planet. And groundwater, ocean water, everything. And this little tiny dot that you can't really see is all the available fresh water. And Maya talked a little bit about climate change. And with climate change, sea level rise is one of the aspects that we're seeing. Sea level rise, we generally talk about two main factors. We've got CO2 emissions going up, the air temperature is rising, that's causing the snow and ice to melt, that's raising sea level, and also with the warmer temperatures, the ocean is expanding, and that's causing sea level rise. But there's one more factor that we don't talk about as much. And depending on the study, it's, uh, it's been reported that up to 40% of sea level rise is actually caused by the way we're using water. And that we are using water at a rate that's higher than uh, evaporation and then precipitation can return that water back to the land. And so this tiny little circle, we're actually making it smaller. We're out of balance right now. So I found this one, I, I liked it. If you can't read it, Santa's saying, when did I have to give bad kids all that coal? Santa, it's not all your fault. Although we might want to look at some of, some of those issues. Um, we've got a plan to, to address these issues. In 2013, the Thurston Regional Planning Council and all our, our member jurisdictions adopted the Sustainable Thurston Plan. And it was multiple years of work with more than 100 different entities coming together to define what we want our area to look like in 2035 in relation to the environment, economy, our communities, transportation. And it includes targets and it includes actions to get us there. In 2018, we adopted a climate adaptation plan. So considering the things that we already know are occurring, like the hotter, drier summers, water, quality and quantity, is a big component of that climate adaptation plan. And a quick aside, if folks haven't heard, we're now also working on a climate mitigation plan with the county, Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater to look at reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions. So, both the Sustainable Thurston and our Climate Adaptation Plan has a number of actions that we need to take. And again, these are, some of these are, some of these are bold and they're long term, but if we're gonna look out past 20 years, we've got to take some bold action because water is becoming more scarce. Uh, reclaimed water is part of the solution. I talked a little bit about Yelm. Um, Yelm was the first uh, class A reclaimed water facility in the state. And they are using that primarily for irrigation of city facilities, and they are inf infiltrating some of that to get it back into the groundwater. But this biggest piece <coughs> is what they're putting back into the Nisqually River, which is great, uh, especially during summer months, and, and yet, the biggest limiting factor in the use of that reclaimed water is infrastructure. Same with Lot. Lot, it has the capacity to do about <laughs> three, and a half, uh, million, uh, three and a half million gallons per day of reclaimed water. And there, it's doing a lot of the same things. It's irrigating the Tumwater Water Golf Course. It's also being infiltrated for groundwater. But the biggest limiting factor is the infrastructure, the purple pipes that we need to convey that reclaimed water. And when you think of the infrastructure that we have currently to, for our drinking water and for our sewer, I mean, we've been working on that for 100 years to now try and get purple pipe everywhere where we could use reclaimed water, incredibly expensive. So it's part of the solution, but it's not the silver bullet. So looking at the costs of some of the measures, reclaimed water is part of it, uh, new storage can be part of it, 
desalination is probably not part of it anytime in the near future because it's incredibly expensive and very, very energy intensive, so it doesn't help us on that greenhouse gas emission side of things. Um, it's in conservation. And the, on the ag side of things, they've been doing a great job with water conservation. Across the nation, we're using the same amount of water to irrigate today that we used in 1970. And yet, we are irrigating millions more acres. And that's because we're doing it more efficiently. We're not using earthen canals anymore. We're using contained pipes that don't leak. We're not just uh, flooding fields. We're delivering the water in the amounts and at the times that it's needed. We need to be doing those kinds of actions more intensively on the urban side of the equation. In Thurston County, our water use, um, this is per capita water use. And right now, we're at about uh, 158, or no, 100, maybe that's, 180, sorry, 180 <laughs> gallons per day per person. That's actually pretty high. Um, the national average is about 110. One of the reasons that we are higher is we're a pretty rural county and rural lands tend to use more water than urban lands. That's, we need to grow food, so that's, that's, I'm not saying that as a, uh, as a detriment, it's just a fact. So we use more water than a lot of areas do. But we have a goal for 2030, by 2035, to have that down to 139 gallons per day. That's gonna take a lot of effort. And our plan talks about, a lot about uh, exempt wells, so that, I'm not gonna go into detail because that's what we've been talking about all, all evening. Um, it also talks about increasing our coordination across our water purveyors to make sure we're delivering water where it needs to be in the most efficient way regardless of jurisdictional boundaries. We're gonna need to look at our urban growth areas and areas that are in that urban growth area where it's prohibitively expensive or inefficient to extend water and sewer out there and potentially reduce the size of those UGAs, which means more density inside our cities. That's something we're gonna to need to consider if we're gonna conserve the water we need to. And we need to keep going on the things like, uh, that, that have been in place for some time and we need to amp them up, like switches to more efficient toilets and dishwashers and uh, making sure that our, our industries are operating as efficiently as possible. There are also some tools that are in place that we haven't used as much, and we probably will under the, the Hearst fix, um, but Water Trust, and that's a program where a water rights holder can take part or all of their water right and temporarily or permanently put that into trust to be managed by the Department of Ecology for either in-stream flows or to, for other beneficial uses uh, at, that when water is at a short supply. Then there's also water banks, and this is amping up in popularity on the east side and in the Dungeness, but we don't have this yet in Thurston County, and it really is just a place for people to buy and sell water rights. So, People that have more water than they need can sell part of that water to someone who needs it. Including, doesn't ecology actually purchase some of those for industry flows too? Retire and retire. Pricing is a big part of the equation because just like any commodity, water use is responsive to price. And all of our water systems here use tiered water pricing, but we could be more aggressive with that. For example, the lowest tier for um, Tumwater and Lacey is at 150 gallons per day. And, and so that's a little higher than we want to see, and that's the lowest tier. And so we could be more aggressive with that tiered water pricing. And we could be more aggressive on the incentive side. City of Olympia, it has a program where if you had to uh, use either 60 or 85 gallons per day or less, you get a break on your sewer, the sewer part of your utility bill. 
But we might need to be looking at things like if you use less than 30 or 40 gallons per day, you don't pay for your water. And instead, we're charging more to those really high water users because that tiered pricing is great to, to curb water waste, but it's not as good to really promote water conservation. And if we're gonna get where we need to be, we need to all be working on using less water. Uh, rain gardens are something that I'm sure probably everyone has heard of. We talk about them a lot for stormwater, uh, but in our area, because we're so groundwater dependent, they're, they're incredibly important for our water availability. We wanna try and capture that water, get it down into groundwater before it goes out to Puget Sound uh, as stormwater, because like I said, the way we're using water right now, we are delivering too much water to Puget Sound too quickly, and that's what's making that freshwater sphere smaller. So we need to get that water back into groundwater. Some old ideas might become new. Um, new York skyline is synonymous with the wooden water tower. Uh, places in Europe are starting to incentivize those coming back. This is in Denmark, I believe it was, where they are um, offering tax incentives to businesses that will put these aluminum cisterns on the top of their buildings so that they can supplement water use in dry months. Lastly, and most scandalous, um, long term we're going to have to change the way we live. Um, our U.S. lifestyle is incredibly water intensive. It takes about 20,000 liters of water to make a pair of jeans. And that's a 10 by 10 box. That's filling this whole area up with water to make one pair of jeans. And we've got a clothing problem. Uh, we, uh, for the world, we're producing about 100 billion garments of clothing per year for seven billion people. That's a lot of waste. We are only using, over the past decade, our use of that clothing has decreased by 36% to the point where now on average, we're wearing a piece of clothing seven to 10 times before we throw it away. That's 20,000 liters of water to make clothes that then we just put in a lamp. We, we, we've got to change that. It's just too intensive. Our diet is another part that we're going to need to look at. It pains me to say this. I, I love you, Mr. Hamburger. But you, <laughs> you take a lot of water to create. Uh, 2,400 liters of water to produce a hamburger. And it only takes 25 liters of water to produce a potato. So I am not suggesting that we all need to walk around in burlap sacks and eat nothing but potatoes. <laughs> but what I am suggesting is that for as long as our population continues to go up and our water use is causing that little sphere of fresh water to get smaller and smaller, we are not sustainable. We are not going to have enough water long term. We have to bring that back into balance. And it's going to take us changing the way we live long term. And we can do this. The Sustainable Thurston Plan gives us a really great start at that roadmap for how we start to change this equation. But it's going to also take a lot more. So with that, thank you. While we're waiting for questions, I want to do a belated shout out to Esther Cronenberg for doing these lovely displays, some of which are on the floor, <laughs> in order to get you to pay closer attention to them next time. She did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. She did a great job. Of putting them. Lacey City Water, we had well water from Carleon Beach, 
We had Olympia City Water, we had artesian water, and we had water from Yelm, city water from Yelm. So we had, should I start at the bottom or the top? No. Okay, also, I want to mention the, the things that affected how people chose. Now, some people chose this one because they liked the strawberries on the jar. <laughs> a lot of other people commented on the temperature of the water, that that seemed to make a difference. And I also noticed that the order in which they were made a difference. Because the one that was last got the fewest votes. And they just feel like that wasn't fair. Anyway, so the winner was Lacey City Water. <laughs> Not by a whole lot, but um, Olympia City Water came in next with six, and Artesian Water came in next with five. Well, actually, wait a minute. It was a tie between Olympia City Water and Artesian Water, which is interesting because last time we did this, Artesian won by a long shot because it was the coldest, <laughs> I think. Well, the Artesian is from the Artesian Well in downtown. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, so I'm trying to remember. Okay, so then we had um, three votes for Carly on Beach and two votes for Yelm. But remember, it was because Yelm was at the very end. <laughs> People got tired by then. So anyway, and I, I don't know that taste of water actually represents the quality of the water. But anyway, it was an interesting experience. Anyway, what colors? Oh, what color? The um, yellow was brown. Um, pink was Carly on Beach. Green was Olympia City Water. Orange was Artesian. And the pink, what did I say that? Green was Olympia City Water. Oh, purple. Um, purple was Lacey. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, we do have some questions. This one is open to any of our guests to speak to. What about banning lawn watering like California? And then, I'm gonna have to decipher this. So, um, what about banning lawn, lawn watering? Is that an option? What do you see? Is it it, it's definitely can be part of the equation. Lacey already limits, um, I think it's an every other day sort of thing during summer months. Except Friday, which is not. No one? I mean, you can't use it Friday. Is. You can't water on Friday. So we've already started in, in that direction. Um, and I, I think that there's a good chance we'll be doing more of that. And, and so the question is the mechanism to do that, right? So the legislature, I suppose, could tell everybody in the state, you're done, you don't get to water your lawn. <laughs> um, it really, I think, depends on that local community. And there's planning concepts and ways that you can build that in. So when we're doing local land use planning, um, a county or a town or a city that's doing its growth management plan or its critical area ordinance and the development regulations can choose to put those types of limits um, from a local perspective. But it is definitely a way to put more water back to the system by not putting that water, because here's the difference. When Mark was talking about the amount of water used in home and George was talking about the amount of water, where usually when you're using water in home, the general rule is that 80% of that water is return flow if you're out in a rural area because it's going back into your septic. And 20 or so percent is consumptive, meaning that has been fully consumed and used and evaporated off. When you use outdoor water to water your lawn, you reverse that rule. 80% of that water is now consumptive. It's being taken up by the plants. It is not finding its way back down into the aquifer. And 20% of that water is then return flow. So it is a big piece of the potential puzzle if you know, we're going to be struggling with these issues as the years come. Okay. All right, next question is for Maya. <clears throat> If a site is proposed for development that was known to be an old mine and possibly a toxic dump site, and we are worried that it might pollute the groundwater, how can citizens find out what contamination exists, and who pays for testing, and what are the next steps? 
Okay, so that's really case by case, depending on the particular area. Um, we also at the Department of Ecology run the uh, cleanup program for our state, and um, so if there is an existing site that's contaminated, uh, whether that's a, ma a mine or let's say a gas station that had an underground tank that le leaked, um, the, uh, our state tries to oversee those types of cleanups and make sure that we're getting the right information we need and understanding what's happening with the groundwater, and we analyze that as a state. We look at what those impacts are, what the contamination is, um, but when it comes to really having to clean that up, usually it's the, the liable party is the landowner or whoever was liable for the activity that created the contamination. So sometimes we will um, pay for some of that initial testing as a state to figure out what that is, um, but many, many times the landowner or the operator or the one who contributed to the contamination is also supposed to have um, a major part of that responsibility under the state's toxics cleanup laws. Thank you. Next question, George, tell, tell us more about deep HTO, uh, how deep the water uh, comes, and where, where is it coming from, where is it going, and sinkholes kicking down the road. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, anyway. Um, well, we don't have them yet, George, but there are, sinkholes are happening across oh, the world, including okay. in when, California. When, when you remove too much water, water is from drained. the oh. Well, um, I don't really have anything to say about sinkholes at the moment. Um, it, it would take a heck of a lot of we're keeping in mind that we were dealing with exempt wells. And the t you know, the total projection for all of Thurston County was, I don't know, maybe 600 or some, some, some relatively small number. And so that amount of withdrawal from any of the aquifers was pretty modest compared to the amount of water that is transiting through. But the question about deep aquifers and shallow, I think, tell us more about it is what the idea is. I think that, um, first of all, as with, any kind, as with any kind of presentation, I presented a simple point of view. The idea that the aquifers are nice and neat and three of them and all, that's schematic. They might not be that way under your house. Ed, they might not be that way at your place. But, but uh, so, the first thing you have to do is, and, and of course, there might not be any water under one particular place. So it's it's not an automatic thing. It has, that's why you hire a well driller and that's why you keep your fingers crossed while they're drilling. <laughs> but the idea would be, let's just, you know, a rural developer walks into the county and the county says, well, We've got these various mitigation programs, but if you want to skip all that mitigation program, you commit to investigating whether there is water in a deep aquifer on your property. And if there is, you hook up to it. And it's adequate quality, you hook up to it. There is, are throughout most places in the county, two or three aquifer layers. Some are quite deep. And those are what the big municipalities are hooked up to, Yelm and Olympia. And uh, I'm not sure about Tomar, I don't really know. Uh, and Yelm's new water will also be hooked up to that deep aquifer. How deep? Okay. How deep? Oh, deep, I'm sorry. Deep is uh, about sea level, or a little bit lower than sea level. The, these deep aquifers, where do they discharge? They discharge. Out in, we don't see it particularly, but out in Puget Sound, there's a deep trough. Like the Nisqually Flats, right outside the Nisqually Flats, there's about a 250 foot drop off. And across that area, there's a huge amount. That's where a lot of that water, fresh water discharge is there. Um, so yes, they're at or below sea level. And then there's an intermediate one the surface one is, well, where you are. 400 feet, let's say. Four, four, about the elevation of Yelm is about 500 feet. So, so there's three down. And 
so if you're taking water from the higher level, or from the lower level, isn't the water that's up to the drain down to fill that, and so then it just lowers the whole water table? Does everybody get that? Is, yes. How do this, where does the water in the lower one come to? Well, the, the, the key to that is what those in, semi-impenetrable layers between the aquifers. The aquifers are totally confined, but they're pretty well confined. So most of the water in the intermediate and lowers are moving uh, toward the Puget Sound, and the water from the upper percolates down quite slowly, not fast. So it's, at least the modeler suggested the instance that you, the, what she's asking is, if we move to a deeper aquifer, doesn't that immediately all that water go down from the surface aquifer down to the intermediate or down to the deeper? And the flaw with that way of thinking is that it thinks, that, again, we're sort of thinking about aquifers as pools, but they're actually water that's transiting. And so all of that water is moving all the time. And the notion that the water comes down rather than comes from the side, it does come from the surface, but it comes up gradient down through the middle of it. Mark, you're not off the hook. <laughs> oh. So from which level of aquifer does the Olympian artesian well come? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's George. Does anyone know the answer to that? I, I think it, it probably comes, I don't know for certain, but I think it comes from either the intermediate or the lowest aquifer. See, again, like, I don't know how many of you have visited McAllister Springs over the years, a fair number of people. Well, the reason we have McAllister Springs is that there's this huge aquifer, but down in there, there's a huge rock, you know, huge rock. And the flow hits the rock, comes up, and services at the springs. Whereas otherwise, it's transiting through to Puget Sound. So that's why we have a big, a big spring there, or at least part of the reason. So what I think the artesian well is, again, the confined layer, that water is under pressure. For whatever reason, the confined layer is broken down here, and the water from the lower pressure so my guess would be it's the, I can't remember the name of the lowest aquifer, but it's. We can name it George. <laughs> I think it's called the Bash On. <laughs> this one is for, for any of our panelists. Many businesses, including restaurants and manufacturers, use very large quantities of water. How do we get them to reduce water use? So, uh, oh, okay. Um, it, tiered water pricing is a big way uh, of, of managing that. If, if uh, like I said, if there, there's elasticity in relation to um, water use and prices, and the more those prices are going to go up, the, the more um, industries, restaurants, et cetera, are going to look for ways to use less and less water. That's the stick side. On the carrot side, we could look at programs like um, WaterWise restaurants uh, that incentivize businesses and industries that hit certain milestones of, of water use reduction, water conservation. And they could get a break on their utilities or some sort of tax incentive. So, um, I, I would. I think price is really our, our biggest um, uh, lever that we have for for industry and the commercial side. Well, while you're still there, I have another question okay. for you. So, do the jurisdictions now require that purple pipes be installed in new subdivisions? No. And the main reason for that is we don't have the purple pipe trunk lines, the big purple pipes, to feed new subdivisions. If we did, then, then maybe that requirement would, would make sense. But until we get even just 
some main lines of, if, so for example, for Lot, right now they, they, they actually only have about three miles of purple pipe. And that's just because it's so expensive. So, With, and can you clarify purple pipe? It literally is um, purple PVC pipe. So this is reclaimed water. It's not fit for human consumption, but it's fit, fit for everything but. And, and so wat watering lawns and watering landscapes is, is the biggest use for these. And so it literally is a, a color of purple. And it has to be conveyed by itself. It can't use any of the other infrastructure. The next question is from Maya. Finding water for mitigation of new and out of stream uses presumes growth is a given. What happens when this new round of found water runs out? Will growth stop? I think we know the answer to B. Yeah, but you're gonna answer A. Well, that's the that's the that's the question of the day. Are we gonna are we gonna be able to rise to the occasion to be able to manage our water in a conservative way um, that goes to the best uses um, so that we can continue to either have some allowance of continued growth or not. And our Growth Management Act is supposed to answer a lot of those questions in terms of how our counties and our cities, our towns grow, um, and whether there are urban growth areas and rural growth areas. And so right now there is not a particular moratorium, um, but the planning horizons of 20 years, like folks said, is not a very long time. So the question is, at what point is there not enough, there's no more water, there's no more give in the system, and then as a society, as a community, as a town, a city, as a state, um, we have to grapple with that particular uh, conundrum and see where it is. But I think what the Stream Flow Restoration Act did that I talked about in the law that the legislature passed in 2018, is it, it reduced water. So there are several wires and watersheds where the 5,000 gallon per day rural exempt water use um, limit was brought down. It's between 900 gallons per day and 3,000 gallons per day. It depends on which particular watershed. The legislature made those decisions the last two weeks that they were negotiating that bill. But they said 5,000 gallons per day, no, it's not sustainable anymore, especially in these water short basins. And since we can generally survive a two, three person plus household on 350 gallons per day in a home, why do we have a 5,000 gallon per day limit? Not that people technically use that, but it allows it to go up that high. So the legislature's also really went into a uh, very uh, taboo territory by taking the risk of saying 5,000 gallons per day ought not necessarily be the allowance anymore, and they brought it down. So there's a lot of those things that are need to go into place, but at some point, um, we're gonna have to decide as a society where we're at in terms of how much additional growth we can accommodate. Thank you. This question I think could go to any of our panelists. What is the impending impact to water quality from septic systems over the next 50 years? So septic systems are huge and we need to make sure that they are upgraded and to standard and they, make, they, they uh, really do contribute to problematic water quality issues, um, especially in the Puget Sound. Um, when we're talking about having to deal um, with nutrients and other problems um, and our, uh, our critters in the Puget Sound and other water bodies need. So um, septic systems, are a bear, they're a big challenge. Uh, a lot of them are in rural areas. A lot of them are being used um, in communities that don't necessarily have the monetary means to maybe have the state-of-the-art septic system or aren't able to pay for getting that septic system uh, repaired and worked on. But there are a lot of programs happening throughout the state, um, including with our local health departments in our counties that are trying to work with landowners to make sure they're using the state of our septic systems. But septic systems do play a part um, in one, filtering water back down to the system to help recharge what we talked about and George talked about. Um, but we need to make sure that they're meeting current uh, standards and they're protective of the environment. Great, so here's the part B to the question. Those of us that are sitting in here, some of us are living with septic systems. If we were going to go home tonight, what would be the take-home message that you would have for those of us with the septic system? Well, that was nicely done. Get an inspection. <laughs> yeah, just get, get, it, yeah, get, get an, an inspection, inspection and then address any of the issues that come up. I, I, one thing I'll, I'll add to this is this is also an issue that is um, that's covered in sustainable person. 
Um, and one of the first steps, we don't even, we don't know how many septic systems are out there. And that's, that's a first step. We've got to know what the playing field looks like. So there's still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done before we fully understand the scope of septic system issues in our county and then that next step of accessing the programs, expanding the programs so that we can get failing septic systems uh, correct. Is there any way of, of, tr of starting that process of finding out how many septic systems there that exist? So there, there was a bill last session um, that would have uh, charged, I don't remember the cost, but it had a fee um, for septic, uh, septic owners. And part of the reason for that fee was to get that inventory of all the septics that are out there and to make a, create a more robust inspection program so that we can get a better handle on it. Um, it did not get very far, that bill. Mm -hmm. No, but it's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Uh, to George. <laughs> Ms. Gwali essentially has a permanent watershed committee, unlike any other, wa uh, in, any other watershed in the state. This long-term institution gave you a big advantage. Do you think all watersheds should have a similar committee or council? Well, that was an easy one to answer. <laughs> I do, I do think that, and I, I appreciate whoever wrote the question. People who are neighbors, recognize each other's needs and wants and stuff and are willing to work together for the greater good. And so uh, I always think about uh, my friend Billy Frank who used to, this, this was his gesture. And this just, we swoop all those people in the Nisqually watershed in because we're all neighbors. We're all part of the same watershed. We need to take care of each other. Now, you've probably heard you probably heard Billy Frank say exactly that, or almost exactly that. So, uh, so I'm kind of channeling him. That's a Nisqually thing too. I'm channeling him for this meeting. Uh, so that's a little in joke. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, yes, I think that one of the things that would be beneficial, and, and I would encourage as other watersheds develop their watershed plan. They consider the, this possibility of creating, let's call it a such and so council. And then the legislature consider the possibility of, you know, I mean, I don't know how many wires there are, about, about 30, let's just say. 62? 62. How many, Al? 62? 62. Al, long-time water resources? 62. 62. So if you, well, maybe a, maybe a, yeah, maybe a hundred thousand per watershed, maybe kind of cost yeah. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it might not be that most, some of them don't want it or don't demand it. But I think that the key thing, the reason we got this quality started was because the state legislature passed a mandate that the college develop on this management plan for the Nisqually River. And for the next some number of years the legislature allocated in the ecology budget earmark a certain amount of money to keep that in the squad. Now we won't talk about who in the state legislature arranged for that, but we will. <laughs> <laughs> if we, we, got we got that money and once it started, it's still going. We also have we created an Esquala River Foundation so we we get a certain amount of uh, activities going that way. And while I'm talking about it, we uh, have a in-school environmental program in almost every fifth grade class in our Nisqually watershed. The students get out twice a year on the stream to do water quality testing. Now, their testing isn't the be-all and end-all of, of the world, but what is the be-all and end-all is building a constituency over all that time. Because actually, I just found out this year in Eatonville, somebody who started in the first year, their grandchild is now in fifth grade. Now, of course, that means they were kind of in, pro in production kind of early. But anyway, <laughs> the, the point being, the point being is that you, you, you protect 
that's what you learn to love. And, and uh, so we've done lots of things in the Nisqually and we continue to build on them. There's nothing stopping other watersheds from doing that on their own in a small sense, maybe with a little bit of seed money to get started. We're really winding up our time here, and there's many more questions, but I do want to invite you to send email messages, perhaps, to our panelists if you have that burning question that we weren't able to get to tonight. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful, uh, comprehensive, positive way to, to, uh, to conclude our evening. I'd like to, let's say a special thanks to our panelists.